Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to the show. My name is Jason Romano. It is always a pleasure to have you joining us and taking time out of your busy day to check us out here at the Sports Spectrum Podcast. As always, you can download and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, everywhere podcasts are found. And of course, all of our content, including the podcast, is found at sportspectrum.com, where we have daily devotionals. We have content updating every single day on the intersection of sports and of faith. You can also go to our YouTube channel, subscribe there, and all of our podcasts are featured on our YouTube page as well as some other videos and cool content that we've produced and shared over at our YouTube page on Sports Spectrum. Today's guests are Daniel and Bree Schlereth. Now, Daniel grew up as the son of an NFL Super Bowl champion. His dad is Mark Schlereth, and Mark, of course, played many years in the NFL, won three Super Bowls with the Washington Redskins and the Denver Broncos, and then went on to a very successful broadcasting career at ESPN, a colleague of mine for many years there at ESPN as an NFL analyst. And then Mark now has moved on to do some work with Fox Sports as well as local radio in the Denver, Colorado area where Mark still resides. And his son Daniel, um, who grew up wanting to be an NFL player, ended up becoming a professional baseball player. Now, he's been a professional for 10 years. He played his college ball at the University of Arizona. He was drafted in 2008 to the Arizona Diamondbacks. He was a member of a World Series playing team in the Detroit Tigers and played four years combined in the major leagues. And in college, he met his wife, Bree, uh, and they married in 2010 and have a couple of kids and a four-year-old girl and and another one-year-old girl and... This story is, we certainly do touch on Daniel's life growing up in light of having a dad who played in the NFL, but this is one of those podcast interviews where we just try to dig in a little more on Daniel and Bree and their journey. Going through um, some heartaches, both uh, Bree going through um, some challenging health conditions and then Daniel and Bree's daughter going through some challenging health conditions as well. And it's a really powerful story of faith and of overcoming and of trusting in the Lord when it feels like there is no hope. And so I hope you really you really enjoy this interview. Without further ado, let's get right to this podcast interview. We sat down with Daniel and Bree Schlereth at a conference recently and uh, just excited to bring their story to you. So without further ado, here, here they are, Daniel and Bree Schlereth. It's my pleasure to welcome Daniel and Bree Schlereth to the program. Guys, how are you? Great, thank you. It is good to talk to you. Daniel, I've worked with your dad for many years, the great Mark Schlereth, three-time yeah. Super Bowl champ, so it's really neat to kind of have you on here and get sure to know you. It was a pleasure for you. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure for me, of course it was a pleasure for me. Hopefully it was a pleasure for him too, right? Uh, but it is really cool because I, don't, I, I sort of know about you through your dad and having known your dad for many years, but I really didn't get a chance to know your guy's story until we... We sat down here at this conference in San Antonio, and I think it's a it's an important story to tell. I think your journey is a very interesting one, so I'm glad you guys are here for the podcast. But let's start sort of with you, Daniel, and really growing up in a athletic world where your dad is playing professional football for many years, certainly with the Redskins and the Broncos, winning Super Bowls, and just kind of what life was like as a child growing up with a, a football-playing dad. Back then, it wasn't. It was normal. I thought everybody else's dad was in the NFL. Uh, I thought everyone's dad was fat and strong. <laughs> uh, looking back now, it certainly was a privilege to, to be living with that in your, in your household. Yeah. You, not many people get to go through that when they're a kid. And, uh, so looking back, I was certainly very spoiled to have him as a father. What are, what are some early memories of kind of going into the clubhouse or seeing him in uniform or – going to any of the games. Give me give me some memories there. Yeah, I got a lot of memories. Um, I, I actually can remember all, all the Super Bowls. Um, we went to probably 95% of the home games. So I, we were always there. Uh, reminded me when Adam LaRoche was talking about his kid being in the locker room. I was that kid. You were that kid. Um, yeah. So just certainly a privilege. And um, 
you know, when you're when you're that young and going through that, you think everyone is spoiled like that and everyone has that same opportunity. But um, there's not a whole lot of kids that get to experience that as a dad. What uh, players? Certainly, your dad played with some great players, including John Elway. What what were what was it like being around some of the other players? I know you said it's kind of normal for you, but do you are you realizing the sort of level as you get a little bit older, especially at your time? when your dad was with the Broncos, that this is sort of a, this is a big deal here. Like These are the Super Bowl champions. Yeah, I, it wasn't a big deal back then. I was like, oh, yeah, everyone wins the Super Bowl. Like, <laughs> I'll win a Super Bowl when I get older. I'll, I'll win a World Series when I get older. And yeah. now it's like, that looks impossible. Yeah. And being in a World Series myself and getting swept, it's like, man, this is like the hardest thing ever. Mm-hmm. So now, as an adult, I just look back and it's like, man, this is, what an incredible career he had. What... The level of play at that, you know, in the NFL is just so high. And as a baseball player, now fighting to get my career back, in a sense, trying to get back to the big leagues, like, man, this is a lot of work and it's very, very difficult to do. Yeah. Tell me about family life at home from a faith perspective and where sort of that was rooted in you, where where your um, connection with the Lord started. Well, for me, it was, it was simple. I just... I grew up like that. My dad was was a strong, strong Christian. He's a um, so that was always brought home to me. Which mm. another that was I was spoiled. You yeah. know, looking back, it's like man, I had this awesome role model, and he's a he's a follower of Jesus. Um, so it was like I really was very fortunate to have that. Um, in your home, your mom and dad hosted a lot of team Bible. Studies. We had Bible studies. Yeah, so. thank you. Uh, we hosted, my parents hosted Bible study every, if there wasn't a Monday night game, they'd host it on Monday. Uh, a lot of times on Tuesdays during the week, because usually Tuesday in the NFL is an off day. Mm-hmm. So we'd have like a group of 30 people, 30 wow. 30 players in their lives. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the house was just full of Jesus every week. Mm. So that's, you know, we were so fortunate to have that and have those people around and just grow up with it. Um, yeah, it was, shoot, it was amazing for us. Growing up with your dad and your mom and your, and your sisters and just being around the household and sort of that faith aspect of making it uh, your own versus kind of following in the footsteps of your, just what your parents were. Was it, at what point in that journey is it going from the faith that they passed down to you to your own faith? That really... That really wasn't instilled where I was like, all right, I'm going to attack this Jesus thing. I'm really going to follow until, gosh, I always had a belief. I always knew there was a God. Uh, I believed in the Bible. But I feel like when you're a kid, you don't really, you kind of, in a sense, you take it for granted. Um, And I know I certainly did until, really until my mid-20s probably. And usually, like you heard today in the conference when they talk about major league players we we don't need like you seem like you don't need jesus or you don't need god in your life because you you feel like you have the world at your fingertips yeah um so it was really when after i got hurt and it almost seemed like nobody wanted me anymore was like man i'm not as cool as i thought i was um and it took getting hurt um getting non-tendered by the team that i practically grew up with going to a world series with this team uh being on playoff rosters with this team it was like man does anyone want me anymore yeah and that was when I was kind of like all right man well I got to put my faith back into God um so that was that was kind of the time where I was like man I better take this a little bit more serious yeah we'll talk about sort of the faith journey in a little bit and when it really got serious in a moment here we're talking to Daniel and Bree Schlereth on the Sports Spectrum podcast Bree I just want to ask you had you ever heard of Mark Schlereth or the Schlereth family or were you sports fan growing up did you have any idea like sort of who he was or anything like that? I <laughs> wish curious. that I could say that I did. But yeah. honestly, like, I grew up in a tiny farm town in Ionia, Michigan. And, like, I didn't grow up with ESPN. Like, you know, yeah. we didn't even have Nick at Night. Like, people are like, you never watched Saved by the Bell? <laughs> like, no, I didn't. Um, and so in in college, you know, I just, I just knew Daniel. Yeah. And that it was really hard to pronounce his last name. <laughs> and it That's wasn't... Terrible. <laughs> it took a long really time to pronounce that last name at ESPN, did. too. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. until like, Still gets we met and started dating that 
and was like, oh, this is my dad, and he is on ESPN. And mm. like, even then, I knew nothing about his career mm. or what he what he did for ESPN, let alone the football background. I didn't know Which is good. That was good for me to hear because I have I a bet. tough time trusting as it is. Sure, sure. So that actually helped out a lot. That's really great. We'll <laughs> talk. We're going to talk more in a minute about how you guys met. Um, but, Daniel, I want to ask you, because your dad was a football player, mm -hmm. and you became a baseball pitcher. So what happened there? Why weren't you – where was football and where was baseball? Where, as you're growing up and started to be, get more active in sports, where did the track say, okay, all of a sudden the road is going to be baseball? Well, the track ended my football career when I became 5'11 and <laughs> <laughs> smaller frame. So yeah. that, I, that took a uh, – that kind of slammed those dreams shut. Although there is a few really great quarterbacks that are under six feet, Russell Wilson and Drew Brees, but yeah. I'm not one of them. Uh, so that that road stopped, and I had to take the other fork when uh, baseball presented itself. So what but was, I I am a football player at heart. I'll, I you said something about it's a dream. My game, that was man. your yeah, dream. That right? was my game. Yeah. So that's funny. Uh, I kind of take that out to the mound with me. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it it doesn't. But you didn't have to make that choice till college because he could have played football in college mm -hmm. or baseball. So yeah, I got recruited for both. And okay, uh, what my dad, did you play my in dad didn't push me. Although he was upset when Boise State came after me because he's an Idaho guy and yes. he cannot stand Boise State. That's funny. Um, what position so did you play? I played quarterback and a little bit of safety, but I was more of like a I uh, kind of did a bunch of different things. So if I would have played football, I probably would have figured that out there, offense or defense. How did your dad react when you chose baseball instead of football? He didn't care. That's the great thing about him. He didn't care. If I wanted to play football, he'd probably like, oh, that's probably not the greatest if you want to be in the NFL or, or in the big leagues. Yeah. But um, he never said one thing. But for me, we kind of talk like, what's our best option here? Do we have a better chance? Because I want to play professional. Um, I want to play at that level. Um, and we kind of talked like, listen, man, there's not a lot of smaller frame guys in the NFL anymore. And baseball, you're throwing in high school. I was left hand, I'm left handed. I was throwing 95 plus. So he's like, you might have a longer career yeah. and a better career if you choose baseball. So we, we went that direction. So then we get to college. You choose the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And a lot happens in college. It's when you meet Bree and when life starts to happen and you're pitching and you're doing well. So take us to college time. And then, Bree, you can kind of chime in, too, and what that was like not only as a pitcher but then eventually meeting your future wife. Yeah, college was sweet, man. I got kind of everything done in college that I wanted to do except for graduate. <laughs> um, Which she think, doesn't like. Uh, Someday. <laughs> yeah. Um, College was a whirlwind, really. Um, as a college athlete, you don't really have much time off. Uh, so when you do, you you take advantage of that time. And uh, I met her my our first year, our freshman year, and uh, just really didn't start hanging out until until the last year. But college went by. Jeez, it seemed like it went by in yeah. in a flash. Yeah. So um, I. It was mostly just all baseball until the time where I started hanging out with her, and then things kind of changed a little bit. But uh, when you're an athlete, it's like, man, sport just takes over everything, even over school, uh, which as a as a player, you miss a bunch of school as it is. So it was almost like baseball is my sole focus here. I got a chance to get drafted. I have a chance to play in the big league. So that was really my main focus, and then she walked into my life. And, um, <laughs> and I got the athlete thing because I was a gymnast, and so – I had been doing gymnastics since I was five years old, so it is a much different dynamic. I knew that college was my final hurrah of gymnastics. There's no professional gymnastics, and so right. I focused more on getting my degrees in elementary education. And so I, you know, would practice, and then I'd go home and study and try to, you know, get my studies in. And so where, he where was the she was more studious than I was. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, that's what we need in our yeah. lives, right? Right. <laughs> need a balance, sir. Exactly. So let's talk, Bree, from your perspective. Um, tell me a little bit about your journey through faith, and then let's talk about the first few times that you met Daniel and sort of what that was like. So from really childhood, I grew up going to church in the church. My family didn't really become, I would say, like, has invested in the church until my grandpa was diagnosed with cancer and then it was kind of like we had nowhere else to turn but to Jesus and man we were in it at that at that time and I was probably eight or nine-ish um, 
And then that kind of took me all the way through high school into college. Once I got to college, I, I definitely like was the first time away from home, out in a new place, kind of spreading my wings, learning a lot about myself. And I feel like I, you know, kind of took a step back away from that like Christian kind of upbringing and who I knew I really was. And so Daniel couldn't have come into my life at a better time because I had really made the choice of like, no, I'm not, I'm not really liking this direction that my life is going. Um, I was still doing well in school and, you know, having success as a gymnast in college, but just felt like something was off and missing. And it seemed like pretty quickly after I made that choice, then um, I had met Daniel previously well, our freshman year, like I said, and we had some classes together and, you know, we'd joke around and stuff at study tables or say hi in the hallways. And, um, but it was honestly like a switch was flipped. Like our relationship from the moment that we both knew we were interested in one another, it was like, I could not have picked a better person by hand. Like, I just feel like God really was like, this is, this is your gift because yeah, I agree. we, <laughs> he is a gift, he is, yeah. but it, it was, it's just everything that I had ever wanted in somebody else, someone that believed the same things that, you know, loved Jesus and wanted to raise a, a family and all that things. We just like so perfectly aligned that we knew and six months later we were engaged and a lot of people thought we were crazy and we, there was a lot of resistance there because it did happen so fast and it was so close to the draft that it was like, you know, from kind of his side of things, like, well, Lisa, yeah. you need to it's... focus on <laughs> baseball. Like, you just got drafted. You can't focus on some girl from Michigan. Like, what are you doing? Right. Um, but we, you know, got engaged and had a longer engagement. And I did the traveling thing with him as much as I could because I was still in school, student teaching. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of the first like act of God that we saw was Daniel was drafted to the Diamondbacks and I was still going to school at the University of Arizona, which is, you know, 45 minutes or so away from and the spring training in Tucson. Spring yeah. Training the in next Tucson. Year. So it was like, you know, just, we didn't have to be apart. It was wonderful. And then as I was finishing up my student teaching, he was traded to the Detroit Tigers. And as I said before, I'm from Michigan. So I was like, Thank you, Jesus, really. Mm. I've always wanted to go back to Michigan. And it was like he was, you know, leading us just where we wanted and needed to be. So that's really cool. Let's talk about your journey for, into the majors a little bit, Daniel, and being drafted, first of all, what that was like to be drafted to Arizona and just from, a, from an athlete standpoint, not from a f sort of family standpoint and sort of got orchestrated, but just from a, from a coolness aspect, I guess, of, oh, wow, I got drafted to the – the Arizona Diamondbacks. Take us back to that. Yeah, that was a sweet day, man. Um, we were in the – we had a – our last two years at Arizona, we had – we were preseason ranked number one in 2008. And in 2007, we were number one for a good chunk of the year. We blew it in the playoffs in the postseason both times. Um, so we had great teams. So that kind of added to the excitement, I guess, when you're playing on a great team and then you have this personal success too. Um, so I was actually at practice. We were getting ready for University of Miami in a super regional. And um, I got called during practice, left a message on my phone, and then I called my agent right after that. And that he, he was like, hey, man, do you, you know what happened? I was like, no, I was, we, were, we had a workout. He's like, you got taken 26 by the Diamondbacks. So I was like, this is the coolest thing ever, Whoa, man. You're like in we're the at middle a super of regional, yeah, yeah, about, I mean, we should have went to Omaha in my opinion, but. Um, we got beat in three games there, so um, yeah. T talk. It was a whirlwind, and um, it's always nice to look back at that day and, and realize how special that was. So we are at a conference with a lot of other baseball players, and you hear their journeys. And we were talking to a guy yesterday whose journey took him to like nine different cities, and they weren't even cities; they were like small towns. And he did the whole minor league trek, going from town to town to town. For you, you get drafted by the Diamondbacks, and in 2008, 
you start your minor league year in 2009, you're two months in, and then you get promoted to the majors. That does not yeah. happen too often. So mm -hmm. what was that like for you, not only in your couple of months in the minors, but then all of a sudden in May of 2009, you're, you're in the show already. Yeah, that I blacked out for a lot of that time. Uh, <laughs> I was a month and a half in the minor leagues, and there was talk of me going up, but I was like, there's no way. There's no way yet. You know, I, I was like, I got to put in some more time. I didn't know what I was doing, honestly. Yeah. I just figured out what I was doing this last year at age 30. Right. Um, so at 21, I was like, man, this is, I have no clue what's going on. I get called up after a month and a half, maybe 25 innings into my professional career. Um, so I get called up and, um, yeah, it was an absolute just, it was madness. What do you remember about that day? The day, the major I league debut? I remember nothing. I was... I remember Brian, I remember Brian McCann. That's the only thing I remember. Getting behind him in a count, I was like, "This dude's gonna mash a fastball if I throw in here." But luckily, I still had, I had some velocity, so um, I got lucky against him. Had a one-two-three inning, and uh, I honestly don't remember what happened after McCann got out. I was like, "All right, he's out. Now we can roll." Was your was your parents there? Your dad there? Were you there, Bree? Or was everybody there? Or was I it think literally so. like, so quickly? Was there. It happened so fast that I was in. Uh, I was not able to get a flight to get me to Phoenix, the game because right? he told so me, Phoenix. Yeah. "No way am I pitching tonight." Like they just called me up. You know, I'll pitch half tomorrow. hour of sleep. It, I mean, it, it literally. Yeah. When he says it happens fast, he's not just like saying that it happened so fast. I got the quickest flight that I possibly could, but of course, you know, he pitches that night, yeah. and and I'm I'm okay with that. That that kind of, you know, is that like bookend of his. Um, career, I guess, and that childhood goal of getting to the major leagues, and I was really only there for that last little stint of it, so I think it's totally appropriate that it was him and his parents and his sisters, and were your grandparents there, maybe? I have, the, I honestly don't remember. That, like, it's so amazing that you have no journey memory. With him, you know, wow. Right? That's so amazing. So you, you go on, and you play four years in the majors, and you pitch those four years right from when you get called up. So yeah. you really don't have a lot of experience in the minors. You just are thrown into the fire, per se. But then you're also traded, and there's a lot of things, different things happening. Take us through sort of 2009, 2010. You guys are getting married. Your time as a major league pitcher. Just kind of the whirlwind of all the things happening. And then we'll really get to some of the other big things that are going on. It didn't even feel like a whirlwind. It just felt easy. Easy. Okay. Yeah. Like it, for me, that first day, once we got the first day out of the way, it was just kind of... It wasn't completely smooth, but it just seemed like it, it was. It was almost like, all right, this is what I'm supposed to do. Hmm. Like, I'm in the big leagues now. I was supposed to be in the big leagues quickly. Not that quick, but quick. Yeah. And we're here now. We're, we're here to stay for 15 years. I was going to – I'll pitch for Arizona for the rest of my career, and, and it'll be gravy at the end of the day. Um, didn't happen like that nine teams later, but um, – you got traded after after I might start rambling here, so just cut me off whenever. This is a podcast. You can ramble All right, cool. as long as you like. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so 2009, I get picked in 08 by the Diamondbacks. First, their first round pick. 09, make my debut. Pitch the rest of that year with the Diamondbacks. Um, later in 09, at the winter meetings in December. I get traded with Max Scherzer. Uh, it was a big, Granderson. it's like a seven or eight player trade. It was a big trade, mm -hmm. and I got thrown in there. And when I, my dad, well, I was, I think she was in school still. Mm -hmm. I was at home at my parents' house, and my dad knocks on my door, and he's like, I think he just got traded. I was like, come on. I just finished my first year. Like, I this... I, is there something in my contract to say where I, you can't get traded within your first year? Right. Like, that doesn't happen, obviously. Right, right. And uh, he's like, no, your, your name is on the bottom line, the ESPN tracker. Yeah. On the bottom line, you just got traded, dude. I was like, what? It was like 7 in the morning. Um, wow. And so I wake up, I turn on TV, I'm like, dude, I'm leaving Arizona. He texted me like... I'm going to the Tigers, and I was like, "What are you talking like it, about? It was, What's the Tigers?" You know, like it didn't even <laughs> register me that oh, it's a new team. <laughs> yeah, know? I honestly thought that couldn't happen, so it turned it on, and I talked to AJ Hinch, who was the manager at that time, uh, Josh Burns, who was a general manager for the Dimebacks, and then I end up talking to Jim Leland and Dave Dombrowski shortly after that. I'm like, "Holy cow, this, this is, is happening!" Yeah. 
this is really we're really doing this. Um, was it good that it happened in December, so it gives you a couple months to sort of no, that definitely helped. settle in and not be like March twentieth and you're. If you know, it was like in July, I'd be like, "What's happening now?" Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I got a pitch with a new jersey on and all that stuff, but yeah. Uh, so that yeah gave me some time to settle down, because um, that was definitely a shock, and uh, it was perfect for us. She finished school. Her parents are from Michigan. End up playing for the Tigers those next three and a half years and uh, had a great time there. Was on, like, two, in my opinion, two of the most talented teams on paper that anyone's ever seen um, and still got booted from the postseason twice. But uh, had some great years there. And then, uh, yeah, that was – it was enjoyable. So, Daniel, you end up in Detroit. Pretty crazy story of how you get there. And you're on. You said you were on two of the most talented teams uh, on paper that you've seen. That 2012 team makes it to the World Series. That's pretty talented. Uh, you got an American League, you know, championship ring. Yeah. And you were on the DL, so you didn't pitch in the series. But does, what kind of memories come back from that team and just being around an atmosphere that's going all the way to the, the World Series? I mean, that's pretty awesome. That was that was actually a difficult season for me. Just because I couldn't do anything and I was hurt, I was on the disabled list. I think from May, mid-May to the end of the year, so I couldn't do anything, which was which hurt because that was a big part of the 2010 and 2011 teams. Yeah. Um, so that it just it you know just not being there with the team and um, as they were having all this success, you know, it was like man, there's nothing I'd rather do than be on the like be on the field. So that was tough. It was like, yeah, we're winning, but I can't do anything. Yeah. Um, so I really feel like I was—I didn't participate or wasn't a huge factor of that season. But at the end of the day, it was it was cool to chip in the first month, maybe, although it wasn't a great chipping in because my shoulder was hanging by a thread. Yeah. Um, but just to be around that group of guys, that that talent was just—it was pretty. It was a pretty cool thing to be a part of. And we had a really big like family feel to that those years and that team. great a lot group. of like really they'll be friends of ours forever you know we still keep in touch with a, a lot of them just the the guys and girls would get lunch together and then go to dinner together or go like we just really liked and enjoyed each other's company refresh our listeners who was on that team in 2012 oh my gosh there's probably eight all-stars on that team yeah um Justin Verlander, Cy Young winner. Max Scherzer, Cy Young winner. Rick Porcello, Cy Young winner. <laughs> yeah. um, Annabelle Sanchez, who was striking out everybody. Doug Fister, who's been pitching forever now. Miguel Cabrera. MVP. MVP, multiple MVP. Mm-hmm. Um, Victor. Victor Martinez. Stacked. Uh, Prince Fielder. Prince Fielder, yeah. Austin Jackson. Uh, Brandon Inch, who was a... Probably the biggest fan favorite I have ever seen in my life for one city. Huh. And you don't even think of Inge as like the superstar stud. He's a good player. A good player. He, people in Detroit would die for that guy. I'm not wow. kidding. Like they love Brandon Inge out there. Uh, and he was an all star third baseman. Um, Gerald? Gerald Laird. Alex Avila was on that team. Uh, Brennan Bosch, when he set the world on fire for. Almost went to the All-Star game his rookie year. Yeah. He was still playing well. Austin, yeah. He was Mentioned stacked. Him. The just, whole point is just so stacked. stacked. Jose Valverde didn't blow a save the whole year. Wow. Joaquin Benoit, who his innings took maybe 45 seconds to complete. Um, did you get to travel with the team? Joel Zumaya, who Were you, threw 112. Zumaya. Oh, my gosh, he did, um, right? Like so the team was loaded. Did you I travel think. when they were in the World Series? Were you at? Were you I with the team? You didn't. I did. Okay. I did all my rehab. I did all my shoulder rehab. They sent me home to my original doctors that did my Tommy John surgery, so they're familiar with my body. Um, I went back home and, and rehabbed in Denver with the Stedman Hawkins Clinic, which was really good of them to do. Uh, and then went back. We went back for the World Series, uh, actually for I think Game Three and Game Four in Detroit. And we got swept. Yeah. So. Even uh, though you lost, pretty cool. What, what was that like? Just witnessing a World Series in your home stadium, <laughs> even though you weren't pitching. It's pretty Man, cool, right? That place, I'd never heard a place like that. Wow! And when I say it was like a Super Bowl atmosphere, think of a Super Bowl atmosphere at your home stadium, hmm. and it that place was just raucous. I mean, it was incredible. It was just it was a Super Bowl playoff kind of atmosphere. 
Let's fast forward now, and I'll just say the year because your your career. <laughs> You said nine teams when we were talking earlier yeah, uh, that you've pitched so. with now. And so <laughs> we've sure. only talked about Arizona and Detroit and yeah. your college. So we'll get to like sort of the journey that your pitching career has taken. Uh, but I want to talk about the journey with your family. So 2010, you get married. 2012, you're, inju- you're injured. Your team's in the World Series. 2014, crazy year. Tell us what happened in 2014. Start. Okay, so I'll I'll start. 2014, um, you know, entering Pittsburgh with, with Pittsburgh. Yep, we were with Pittsburgh in spring training, and everything seemed good. I, um, my doctor had called me and was like, "Hey, I think we should, you know, check your thyroid." I years previous, I had a cyst that they had to drain, and so I was like, "Yeah, sure, no problem." And so we did that, and the thyroid ultrasound came back abnormal and about this same time we had found out that for some reason paperwork was filed wrong done wrong and myself and my daughter did not have medical insurance so I remember calling Daniel just bawling like what am I gonna do what if I have cancer and I can't get a biopsy and you know I have to wait a whole year and just like another miracle is dropped on us Daniel is then traded to the Detroit. Detroit Tigers who not by any coincidence in my opinion, but has the world's leading thyroid cancer specialist Mm. in that city. And so we are kind of, you know, like in this tornado of just stuff, you know, like we're not only moving ourselves to another team, but I'm trying to now get this biopsy done that I've been waiting to do because now we have medical insurance because we're with a new team. And I knew like, while they were doing the biopsy, I just knew that it, like something was different. Mm. Um, not that there was panic in the room, but they had someone there testing the cells right away, and she was kind of like, yeah, um, we'll be in touch with you soon. And I was actually on an airplane to go and see Daniel with my daughter, Quinn, when they had called me and told me my biopsy was abnormal and more than likely cancer, and I would have to get it removed. Mm. And so I remember, like... I was kind of in shock. I remember taking a picture of Quinn and I on the airplane, like all smiling, like, yeah, we're going to go see daddy. It's so exciting. And now I'm like, what was, like, what was I doing? You know, there was no moment of like even really processing it. It was just like, okay, we're going to get this taken care of. And Daniel is playing baseball. It's, you know, every day he's playing baseball through this. So, um, I, you know, dug into the Bible, looked for scriptures. You know, I was just had myself convinced that it was not cancer. You know, this is not cancer. I'm going to get my thyroid removed and it'll all be behind me. And so I had that surgery end of June. um, And when I woke up from surgery, they told me that not only did I have thyroid cancer, but it was so severe that had um, metastasized onto my vocal cord. So the surgery that was supposed to take, you know, an hour and a half took closer to four hours. And even now, like talking for long periods of time, my vocal cords are kind of affected from that. And because it had metastasized and because it had taken my whole thyroid, that I had to get radiation. And so I went on a four week, no iodine diet and could not take any artificial thyroid anything. So which basically leaves you, your thyroid regulates your energy, your hormones, your sleep, like so many things. So I essentially, for the last two weeks, was a zombie. And Mm. we were so blessed that my parents lived, you know, an hour and 15 minutes away because Daniel's at the field and we were renting a house over an hour from the field. So it was a huge sacrifice on his part to, you know, be far from the field, but it was a home that we could have help come to and a yard that my daughter could play in. So my parents would do just that. They would drive up and I would do everything I could to get to that point where they were done with work and they would give Quinn a bath and feed her dinner and put her to bed and I would just go to sleep. And then kind of the next, Danny would get home and you know, I'd spend a few minutes with him and kind of start up until I had radiation. And then radiation was an easy go in, you drink the radiation. Poison. Yep, (laughs) you drink the poison and then you are you have to be away from everyone for three days. So his parents flew in and took care of Quinn. And I guess that's where you can kind of pick up. So 
Um, well, let me ask you a question first right. before you pick up. Where are you, when you get this news, because a lot of people have gotten this news, are you, what's, give me your emotions. Are you angry? Are you angry at God? Are you scared? Are you sad? Are you confident because you believe in trust in this Lord, right? Well, give me some idea of your emotions and sort of what you were thinking and feeling. Um, I was fresh out of surgery and I remember being frustrated, like, like frustrated with God. Like I believed in you that this wasn't cancer, you know, like yeah. <laughs> why didn't you have my back on this? But I, my honest feeling was like, this is during baseball season. You know, it was almost like, oh gosh, I'm going to, like, I'm going to be the reason why Daniel can't perform or something like so that. So you're more concerned about the inconvenience yes, of it in like, some ways. Yes, like, this can't happen now. Like, we are yeah. mid-season. And we were, again, very blessed that Daniel's pitching coach, or one of Daniel's yeah. coaches, which never happens in baseball, but the day of my surgery, he let Daniel leave the field and stay with me for the next three or four days. Mm. And that's longer than you get when you have a child, you know. Yeah. And Daniel, you know, kind of told him what was going on and told him, I, I cannot perform right now. I just found out that my wife has cancer. And, yeah. you know, we were just kind of going through the deep of it. What about you as a husband? You find out this news. You're trying to keep your career going here, your Major League Baseball career. You're pitching in Detroit. You get traded. What is, what's going through your, your, your process and your mind here? Uh, I, <clears throat> when you hear something like that, I mean, you, you can't really – I can I can compartmentalize a bunch of stuff, but when it comes to a family member, I that was a little too much for me. Mm. Um, so I actually I showed up to the field. I don't know what day this happened. I think it was before the surgery happened. Or maybe it was after. No, was it, it after? Was on the day of the surgery. Okay. Yeah. So I go in and I'm thrown, and I just like for some reason I'm just I I start to get emotional. I just can't really control that. So the pitching coach is like, "Dude, what does it matter?" Because no one knows about this. Right. It's not something you're um, bragging about. No, I don't talk about it. Right. No, and I'm not going to bring any extra attention or whatever to myself or to what's going on. So I told them, and by the grace of God, Detroit, let me. they let me spend that time. They put me on a restricted or inactive list. Yeah. Um, and I actually got to spend probably two weeks at, with her uh, just away from the game because it was – I couldn't uh, – I couldn't play with that. I couldn't be at the field knowing that she was suffering, uh, and that took it took a lot. So I, you know, thank God for for how uh, the Detroit personnel handled that, and uh, I'm still grateful. Have a place for Detroit, just yeah, they're very special to us. Yeah. <laughs> so then what? You go through the treatments, and you're here talking to me. I think yeah, things turned out good in that, are, Weston, Things are good. How did it go? Um, we so after you have cancer and radiation, you have to wait um, a little over a year before you get another scan, and they scan enti your entire body for uh, any sort of iodine in your body because your thyroid makes iodine, so they would assume any iodine is cancerous cells. And so May of 2015, um, I was officially <laughs> cancer-free, and now they just they monitor... Um, my thyroid every six months and I get blood work every four months just to like make sure my levels and stuff are all good. I do have um, a small mass that they have found in my thyroid bed just like a year and a half ago. Um, but so initial thyroid or initial ultrasound they found the mass then six months later it got a little bigger and then I decided to go sugar-free dairy-free and this last six month scan it showed it shrinking so there was some fear initially with it growing that it could possibly be cancer again but now that it's shrinking they're just assuming it's scar tissue that's mm. just it's so tiny that the ultrasound could even you know like have some miss I guess calculations with the size of it and things like that too but yeah you know it's just something that we continue to pray about and it's I feel great and I'm able to be wife and mom and uh, September 22nd went in to be induced and even like labor all that was very smooth you know it was like quick 20 minutes and Drew her name is Drew Sarah she was born and then it was like chaos just hmm. 
I, I could tell from the look on Daniel's face, from the look on our doctor's face, that just something wasn't right. They, you know, initially put her up in my chest and then took her right away from me and told us, we're going to run some tests, we're going to put her in the NICU and run some tests, and we're going to check if she has an infection in her lungs and her heart and all these other things. And for those two hours of waiting when after you have your child and they're taken from you, and it was just awful. Like, I, I have no other words for it. And a nurse came in and told us that it was her heart and that they didn't have the staff at the hospital to be able to give her what she needed. Mm. And, you know, we went to see her and she's in this, it looks like a, like an astronaut dome, glass dome in her head to give her as much oxygen as she could. And yeah. her tiny feet were bright purple. Her body was just blue. Like she just, wow. you know, didn't look great. Yeah. And at that time, I told Daniel they're going to take her, and I'm not letting this baby leave without a name. And Daniel's grandmother, seven weeks before, had passed, and her maiden name was Sarah, S-E-R-A. Mm. And so we named her Drew Sarah. And Daniel went and followed the ambulance to a hospital about 45, 40 minutes away. So that night, um, Daniel can probably tell you more of that, but she, I was not there. But the doctors came and kind of explained that she had this thing called transposition of the great arteries, TGA for short, and that she would have to have a minor surgical procedure to basically help her heart and the blood flow the way that it should to be oxygenated oxygenated, to get her to be a week old in order to have this surgical operation, open heart surgery at seven days. Daniel, what's happening here from oh, your perspective? Man. It sounds just like, I can't imagine. I'm a, I'm a dad, my yep. daughter, by the way, Sarah is her name. And I just think about if that was my kid, I don't know how I would how I would deal with it from your perspective. What was that like? Yeah, at the time it was just it was kind of chaotic and it was a little bit of madness at the same time. Uh, just I mean, obviously you're in shock at the time, and um, that that's like what we talked about earlier. Yeah, that was like a punch to the face. Like, all right, are you going to follow me now? Are you? What are you going to do about this? From your faith. From my faith. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was like, you better put two feet in here. And that's kind of what, that's what I felt about it. Um, so instead of running away from God, instead of running away, you ran toward to, him. I had to, I did I mean, I stayed every day in the hospital with her. Um, I, I felt like I was going to die personally. <laughs> like I wasn't eating or wasn't doing anything. I just yeah. could not leave that child's side. Yeah. Um, and that's when that was like that second coming of like, are you like, let's, we got to get serious about this. Um, cause that's like in our life, that's when I've needed God the most was at that time. Did you feel that way too, Bree? Yeah. I mean, I immediately jumped in and I mean, the baseball family was great through different Facebook groups. You know, people posted like, we need prayers for Drew. And it, I mean, thousands and thousands of people were praying for her and mm. that gave, you know, us just a little bit of hope and it's not just our prayers it's all these prayers and God is hearing these prayers and she's going to be fine and you know I had a job I had to feed this baby to get her as healthy and as big as possible going into surgery and I mean poor Daniel he literally couldn't well, do nothing it's just a hopeless feeling that's when yeah that's when I was challenged like I I, I have to put two feet in I got to be on fire for God now because this is when I mean I usually try to control the situation. I could not do a thing in this in this situation. So that, for me personally, that just that was a huge challenge and a and a big time wake up call for me. Let's uh, let's wrap up the podcast with a couple things. First of first of all, how is she? How is she doing? Drew is phenomenal. Yeah. she uh, is fourteen months old. She's almost walking. She's met like well hit all of her milestones. Very chubby. She's a chubby, chubby she's little great. girl, like grandpa, big right? cheeks, dark hair, <laughs> yeah, right. blue eyes, yeah. yeah, and she's just, like, you can't look at her and just know that, like, this is just your miracle. She's, she's always happy. That's good. Like, she's the happiest child I've ever seen. That's awesome. That's so great to hear. Um, our last question, and we ask this to all of our guests on the podcast, and really for you guys, it's been a whirlwind. It's not just, you know, what is God teaching you now, it's what is God teaching you in the last three years, but right now, what are you learning from the Lord? Where are you with that? Uh, I think we're really learning to cling to one another through everything. Um, and just that, like, 
God, uh, his plan is already set in stone and done for your life. And like we were mentioning to you earlier, I don't think we would have handled the heart condition in our child as easily. Uh, not that we handle it as easy, <laughs> easily in any ways, but it would have been a lot harder if we hadn't already walked the road of dealing with cancer mm. and having to lean on each other through that. So we just, you know, we clung to one another. We prayed and we cried and we celebrated the huge milestones that needed to be accomplished for her to leave the hospital. Just that, you know, God has her back and he, his hand is on every step that we take in this journey. It's really great. Listen, this has been a treat to hear your story uh, and really cool to just get to know you guys. So I uh, appreciate it. Daniel and Bree Schleyer, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. Wish you guys nothing but the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having share. us. Thank you. And we do thank Daniel and Bree Schlereth for being our guests here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Great to get to know those two and just really awesome people, great people. Uh, come from a really cool family, knowing Mark, uh, Daniel's dad, pretty well. And Mark's a great guy. I've known Mark Schlereth for many years and has always been cordial and, and, and fantastic uh, in my time working with him, both uh, believers in Christ, obviously, and their faith really sustaining them. And I thought this podcast was a neat look inside the dynamics of being a young married couple. And it's not just what goes on from the athlete side, which we hear and see a lot on television, but it's really from the, the spouse side, from the wife's side with Bree and what she was going through, not only supporting her husband and kind of being uh, this baseball wife, but also when she got sick knowing what that meant and the toll that it was taking on Daniel, who was trying to compete and be a professional baseball player and yet still tend to his wife and be the husband that God had called him to be there as well. So really enjoyed their conversation, really enjoyed having them on and getting to know them and uh, look forward to talking to them again very soon. We thank you for joining us here on the podcast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. You can tweet at me at Jason Romano and you can get all of our content, as I mentioned before, at sportsspectrum.com. You can also email me, Jason, at sportsspectrum.com. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear your thoughts on the podcast, on Daniel and Bree's story, as well as any other guest ideas that you might have. And we also encourage you to share this podcast. Tell your friends, share it on your social media pages, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Let people know about this podcast, and I I think there's a really neat thing going on here. A lot of you have listened, 125,000 downloads plus of this podcast, and I really think there's a market for people who love sports and love the Lord, but also just want to hear stories, you know, powerful stories of how God has helped and how people's faith have helped them through situations, and Daniel and Bree Schlereth are no exception to that, so... We thank you for listening. We thank you for sharing, for telling, for commenting, for liking, all the different things that you can do at getting the word out on this Sports Spectrum podcast. We thank you. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum podcast.